in a windswept valley near Ely, Nevada, behind imposing razor wire fences and under the constant gaze of heavily armed officers, several hundred of the West's most dangerous criminals are doing hard time. This is Nevada's maximum security prison, home to killers, rapists, gangsters, the condemned men of death row. And in the deepest, darkest hole of all is the most feared inmate in the state, Patrick McKenna, still wiry and muscular, but dwarfed by the massive corrections personnel who accompany him during any of the rare occasions when he gets out of his cell. You know, we keep moving it, leave it alone. Just... McKenna scoffs at his fearsome legacy and downplays interest in his life. It's a mixture of, of this personal, this persona that's been created by some of the things I've done and some of the things the DA has fabricated the prosecutors over the years and uh, it's a combination of all that a little truth a little not so true McKenna will never leave Ely alive he's serving 16 sentences including four life terms a death sentence and scores of tacked on years he will never live to see the end result of a lifetime of bad decisions he despises those cons who complain that they are the victims I'm prepared to pay for the things that I've done. And I've given 38 years of my life so far to that uh, cause and been on under a sentence of death for over 20 years. I don't believe in a victim defense. I don't believe in whining about my situation or putting the blame on other people, be it uh, family members, uh, a counselor in reform school who beat me. Maybe I fell down and hurt myself one day. So what? Life is a struggle. People go through life and they pick up wounds. They pick up scars. Some people are lucky and only get a few scratches. Other people are very unfortunate and don't make it. Or maybe they become paralyzed or something. I've been very fortunate. I've survived things that you wouldn't believe. Las Vegas in the 70s was a city struggling to find its way. Mafia families still secretly controlled several casinos and held sway with politicians and labor unions. Union violence wasn't uncommon. Well-connected mob figures controlled the street rackets and instilled fear even among lawmen, all at a time when corporations were moving into town in the belief that the casino industry and Las Vegas itself were becoming respectable. Even in such a turbulent period, young Pat McKenna already stood out with a well-earned reputation as a dangerous man. McKenna's first public splash came in 1964 when, at the age of 17, he and a friend abducted a young couple to a remote spot on Sunrise Mountain. The boy was beaten, the girl savagely raped. McKenna was sent away to do 20 years hard time. Shipped to Nevada's old, ominous maximum security prison in Carson City, it didn't take long for the teenage McKenna to make a name for himself. In 1966, he escaped from the state's toughest prison. I snuck out of a, in a garbage truck, but I sprained my ankle when the truck tipped over. You know, I damn near broke my ankle getting out. So you didn't get very far? No, not far at all. For the escape, he was sent to solitary confinement, the hole. He did six back-to-back -back stints in the hole, 29 days per stint, six months overall, nearly all of it in total darkness. While there, he had time to plan. And the day they put me upstairs for the one day in between 29 stretches, I escaped again. And, and uh, me and seven other, six other guys escaped that day, the very day they took me out of the hole. How many days? How we got all the way out. We got all the way out. You know, all past the fence, they were shooting at us. We were going under fire. As we climbed the fences, we were being shot at. Police dogs tracked down the cons, and McKenna was back inside. The following year, he somehow managed to cut through the bars of his cell, but it was noticed before he could bolt. In 1973, during a prison riot, McKenna acquired a knife and took a guard hostage. Again, his escape was thwarted. While inside, McKenna hooked up with a prison gang, the much-feared white supremacist Aryan Brotherhood. In a prison interview in the early 80s, he hinted about his affiliation. Prison, especially a maximum security prison, you're always going to have cliques, 
uh, violent episodes, prisoners against prisoners, the weak uh, getting vamped on by the strong. But how much is contained depends upon the type of administration. In my early years, I was involved in prison gangs. Sometimes it's a matter of personal survival. Sometimes it's a matter of pure criminality. Back then, the prisons were different. They weren't constructed like this. They were big open yards, guys milling around, a lot of freedom inside the walls. All the administration cared about was don't escape, don't breach the walls. What went on inside the prison was our business. That makes for a situation of, uh, you have to control the situation. You have to control that to control your life, to make sure you not only survive, but while you're there, you're doing as good as you can. Despite his gang affiliation and the escapes, McKenna was paroled in 1976. Five days after being released, he went to carry out a murder contract and ended up raping the girlfriend of his target. His parole was revoked. And even then, when I was out, I was doing prison work. My head was in prison because when I got out of prison, I had things I had to do for the crew. There was money to collect. There was vengeance. I was an enforcer. There were things that needed to be done. In 1978, after serving out the remainder of his sentence, McKenna was released again, but wasn't out long. He dutifully carried out another gang contract, although his victim survived, and he was busted for assaulting two women in a Las Vegas motel. On the night he was convicted for the assaults, he was taken to a cell at the Las Vegas jail annex, the place where he would earn his greatest notoriety. The prisoners themselves have revolted up there. There were shots fired. There are two dead bodies in the jail. More on that when our story continues. to fight the situation. When you go to trial, it's not a matter of what took place or the truth. It's a matter of the prosecutor forming his lies and the defense forming their lies. So you have two sets of lies and nobody gives a damn about what really happened. Pat McKenna has had decades to form his opinion about the justice system with hundreds of court appearances as both a defendant and as his own defense attorney. Although police suspect that McKenna has killed at least four people, he's on death row for a single murder, one that occurred inside the Las Vegas City Jail Annex in 1979. I was in a bad mood, real bad mood. He had reason to be. On January 5th, 1979, McKenna was convicted for sexually assaulting two women. He was returned to his cell at the then notorious jail annex at Las Vegas City Hall. He got into an argument with his cellmate. The cellmate was found dead the next morning. There are conflicting accounts about the reasons for the murder. Some say it was because cellmate J.J. Nobles would not perform a sex act on McKenna. Others say it was an argument over a chess game. McKenna has never been willing to tell his side of the story because he's never been willing to take the stand in any of his trials. Now, though, he's ready to talk. There was this little crew, four or five guys, that were wannabes. And when I gave him the cold shoulder and wouldn't have anything to do with them, uh, uh, animosity developed. They approached me wrong, and the one guy took a swing at me, and there was four of them. One of them had a shank, and the guy in front took a swing at me. When he swung at me, I sidestepped, put him in a chokehold, okay? I got him in a chokehold in front of the door, the cell door, which is about so wide, pushing his body against the cell door because the other guy's got the shank, his partner trying to get around, taking shots at, around him, right? I'm using him as a shield for too long. I held him in the chokehold too long. I didn't know it at the time, but I think that's what killed him. In McKenna's eyes, it was self-defense, or at most, manslaughter, a fight between cons, not first-degree murder. But prosecutors went after him, and while awaiting trial for that incident, 
all hell broke loose at the city jail. A siege at the Las Vegas city jail that started Saturday morning when some prisoners overpowered a guard and used his gun to hold him and two other guards hostage. The August 1979 takeover of the jail annex made national news and helped to cement McKenna's perceived status as public enemy number one in Nevada. Two hardened cons, Felix Lorenzo and Eugene Shaw, both facing long prison terms, managed to overpower a corrections officer and gained access to gun lockers containing handguns and ammo. Two other officers were also taken hostage. Most of the 84 inmates were left in their cells, but McKenna says he was invited to join the jailbreak and was given a gun. The plan was a quick breakout, right? That was the plan. That got fouled up because before we could get out Within the first 15 minutes, uh, somebody spotted something was wrong, and the alarm went off, and we were caught. Then, from that, all escape was out of my head. From that point, it just became a question of surviving this thing and getting the hell out of here alive. Lorenzo, Shaw, and McKenna had hoped to walk out of the jail wearing the uniforms of their hostages, but an alarm was triggered, and the jail was quickly surrounded. The area around City Hall was cordoned off, and the siege of the jail began, attracting network news crews and an army of local media. Can you uh, give us an update? Yes, I, I was familiar with Pat McKenna. This is a much smaller town. Jerry Keller was a patrol sergeant and trained hostage negotiator. Years later, he would become Clark County Sheriff, but during the siege, he served as the principal spokesman for the police negotiating team. Well, these three guys that had these three guns were committed career criminals that had uh, you might say nothing to lose, uh, and we were in a tough spot. Keller and the hostage team made phone contact with the inmates to find out what they wanted. The initial conversations were with ringleader Felix Lorenzo, but eventually Pat McKenna became the inmate spokesman. After several hours of standoff, the inmates said they wanted a lawyer as an intermediary. Keller called in Stu Bell, a defense attorney who would later become DA and district right. judge. The, the police were not prepared to negotiate. They were going to do what they needed to do to bring this situation under control. The guards knew that their lives were in jeopardy. They certainly didn't want to lose any lives if they didn't need to, but they were not letting these fellows out. The inmates decided they wanted to add another party to the negotiations, a news reporter. He had called the television station. Uh, he was watching Channel 8. KLAS News Director Bob Stodall not only knew about Pat McKenna, he'd also known McKenna's father, a tough guy involved in local labor unions. Pat McKenna had first talked to Channel 8 reporter Paul Dawkins by phone, then changed his mind about a go-between. Okay, we have talked to the prisoners and they have requested Bob Stodall of Channel 8 to uh, received their responses. As the hours dragged on, Stu Bell and Bob Stodall shuttled back and forth between the inmates in the second floor jail and the police negotiators below. Bob, is there What's the word? Anything? It's real quiet and things are moving, moving ahead. Stodall recalls the face-to-face -face meetings. McKenna is in the middle, um, and I believe Lorenzo was on the left and Shaw was on the right. And, and Lorenzo and Shaw were kind of they were nervous and, and, and ducking down where, where McKenna sat and kind of got his spot. And, and my focus was really on McKenna to kind of, and I saw the other two, but they're always bobbing and weaving. Um, but I stayed, my eyes were stayed right on McKenna. Uh, he see he was in charge, he had control. He told them to calm down, take it easy. The cornered inmates seemed to be making up demands as they went along, a list of 18 at one point, many of them focused on poor conditions at the jail and a few that were more grandiose. McKenna and his crew started by asking for a helicopter and money and some of these other things and our instructions were just kind of play along with them and say, hey, I don't make the decisions, I got to take it back to Keller, he'll tell you. But of course we knew that the answer the next time we came back was no, there's no helicopter. And then, then they'd move to a car or a bus or something less, and pretty soon at the end, they just didn't want to get shot. The snipers had a green light to take them out, take out the, the criminal negotiation side, McKenna, Lorenzo, or Shaw, at any time there was a danger or threat to, to either one of those third-party negotiators. Police believe the inmates wanted the face-to-face -face negotiators because they hoped to grab them as additional hostages. In the early going, Felix Lorenzo had vowed to kill the hostage officers and dump them down the elevator. McKenna, for one, says he wanted things to cool down. And then across the street was a sniper with a red dot on my forehead. 
yeah, while we talked, you know. Um, but I told him much the same. We're just trying to get out of this thing alive, you know. But that, by that time, the thing had deteriorated to a... Once this list is resolved, and if they have any more, we'll probably get those also. After 44 hours of tension, just as it appeared a peaceful end was in sight, guns inside the jail began blazing away. The ringleaders were shooting at each other. The black guy just went crazy, he came around the corner and started shooting. When it was over, police found 18 spent cartridges. Of Coming up, why the situation went sour and how Pat McKenna became the person that he is. It makes him look like Hannibal Lecter out of the movies. second floor jail facility. What has happened is that the prisoners themselves have revolted up there against the leadership. We're only a half a step away from getting the guns out. When things went bad, I was on the telephone with McKenna, and I was talking to him on the phone, and all of a sudden, like nine, ten shots went off on the, on the phone. Everybody's froze for a second. After 44 hours, the siege at the Las Vegas jail ended in bloodshed. Confidential reports compiled afterward by Metro have analyzed what happened. Lorenzo began moving along this track. It's been dissected and discussed, but still there are conflicting accounts. Bob Stodall and Jerry Keller were on the phone with Pat McKenna and were very close to having the hostages released when co-ringleader Gene Shaw started blazing away. McKenna gave this explanation when it was all over. The black guy was on the phone. He was talking to somebody. He came around the corner. Him and Felix got in a gunfight. They started shooting at each other. The black guy just went crazy. He came around the corner and started shooting. McKenna suspects that police cut a secret side deal with Shaw, asking him to disarm McKenna and Felix Lorenzo. If he disarms me and the other guy, that they'll cut him slack on his case. So he come around the corner shooting at us. You know, and all hell broke loose. Police say Shaw was worried that Lorenzo might execute the hostages, and that's what set him off. Jerry Keller thinks the cons mistakenly believed the cops were breaking in. The compressor of a water cooler on a wall on the other side of the jail clattered as those old compressors did. And uh, the three hostage takers, um, Shaw, Lorenzo, and McKenna, were sure that that was a SWAT team trying to burrow through, got into an argument, a gunfight ensued. In all, 18 shots were fired, most by Lorenzo and Shaw in a running gun battle, although it's believed McKenna fired at least two shots. In the end, Shaw and Lorenzo were both dead. One of the hostages was wounded in the hand, and McKenna was hauled out of the jail naked but alive. The televised imagery seemed to confirm his status as Nevada's most dangerous criminal. I mean, these were not people in jail for petty larceny. These were bad, bad actors, and I don't want to promote Patrick McKenna's reputation inside the prison system, but but uh, he was a bad actor, so was Lorenzo, and so was, was Willie Shaw. I remember seeing him naked on the news when they hauled him out naked, yeah. Ken McKenna is Patrick's younger brother, but has also been his defense attorney. In fact, his first case, fresh out of law school, was to defend his brother for the murder of cellmate J.J. Nobles. And Pat grabbed J.J. and started choking him. Before the Nobles case came to trial, prosecutors first tried to nail McKenna for the murder of Eugene Shaw during the jail siege. Two slugs from McKenna's gun were found in Shaw's body. McKenna faced a laundry list of charges from the jail takeover. Murder, the kidnapping of the guards, and numerous counts related to the attempted escape. Acting as his own co-counsel, McKenna beat the murder rap when medical evidence proved that Felix Lorenzo fired the shots that killed Shaw. The kidnapping charges didn't stick either, but McKenna pled guilty to escape and was sentenced to 92 additional years on top of the three life terms he was already serving. One month later, he was tried for the cellmate murder. We, the jury in the above entitled case, find the defendant, Patrick Charles McKenna, guilty of murder in the first degree. As with all of his other trials, McKenna was kept off the stand, unable to tell his version of what happened. But it wasn't the crime itself that put me on death row. It was the things, the other things, like the jailhouse thing. That's what's got me on death row. Not that particular crime. That particular crime is not a death penalty crime. I don't care how you hook it up. It was a fight in, between two felons, at most, manslaughter, at most. He's in that situation where he can never testify. Now, you say, well, what do you mean, Ken? Pat, and there's others like him, 
who are in the criminal system, they can't testify because even if they tell their side of the story and even if the jury believes it and it seems believable and you look them in the eye and it seems sincere, the district attorney is going to stand up and say, when you were 16, you committed this crime. When you were 17, you were convicted of this. When you were 18, you were convicted of this. So no lawyer can ever put Pat on the witness stand to tell his side of the story. It's never been told. Also never told was the larger story. How did Pat McKenna become this arch criminal and monster? Why did he end up on death row while his brother became a successful lawyer? McKenna's family has always wanted to tell the story in his defense, but Patrick would never allow it. it. To him, the story sounds like whining. I so I had a few tough times when I was like, who has it? Well, There's been people, there are people eating out of garbage cans, little kids. Today, they're having a tough time, you know, so they automatically get to grow up to be a criminal? I don't think so. It's a matter of character. It's a matter of character, and it's a matter of, right and wrong. When I was younger, I had opportunities not to be a criminal. I made a conscious choice. McKenna's choices were limited as a youngster, and things happened to him that couldn't help but affect his development. His father was a tough customer involved in union organizing, a violent alcoholic who routinely beat up Patrick's mother. And there was constant abuse uh, in our house. Uh, there was. It was insanity. Although the excuse of abuse may seem overwrought these days, Ken McKenna says it was an everyday reality in the McKenna household. Pat was a bright kid who became bored with school, got into minor trouble, truancy and such, beginning at age 11. At 13, Pat McKenna tried to stand up to his father and protect his mother. His father beat him to a pulp. Mrs. McKenna heard about a new program, the Spring Mountain Youth Camp, a place where wayward boys could get back on track. It was a godsend. This camp had just been created. It was everything. It was beautiful. It was the place that Pat could be sent. He could get away from this violent environment. He would have caring, loving people. He would get his education, and he would have a chance to change his life. The reality of that camp was it was run by pedophiles and sadists who physically, emotionally, and sexually, we assume, abused those teenage children under their care. They would handcuff 13-year-old boys to the flagpole naked overnight in the mountains where it could get below freezing. Naked. Why? They used to make you fight your friends for their entertainment. The counselors would come in. We call it the Saturday night fights. There was no education, there was no school. All they did was give you a pick and a shovel, make you chop weeds and build a road all day. That's what we did. And, it, and then you whip your ass. Anytime you get out of line, they just beat you, slap you down. Now you got to realize we're talking 10, 11, 12 year old kids, and these are grown men, these so called counselors. And after about eight months of that, uh, when they let me out, I was, uh, I was a little bitter about the situation and very resentful of authority because my, my concept of authority was, was those bastards. And I hated them with all, everything, everything I had in me. I hate them today. My memories of, of after he got back from Spring Mountain, he was totally disconnected. And there was a Pat that was my brother uh, that we spent time together and we knew each other. He was gone. Ken and the other McKenna boys didn't go through what Patrick did. Only the oldest son was beaten and sent away. McKenna's father eventually died of a gunshot wound, self-inflicted, lawmen said, although some suspected it was a union-related murder. The death came too late, though, to detour Patrick from his seemingly inexorable path toward death row. There's no question he's a killer. Coming up, McKenna gets the Hannibal Lecter treatment in court, and he nearly escapes from death row itself. Yeah, I'm a criminal, or I was a criminal, big time. Yeah, and I've done 38 years. I mean, I want you, you know, 
can you just off the top of your head think of anybody that you, any criminal that you know that's done 38 years in prison? Just off the top. You remember that guy that Jagger Hoover captured down in New Orleans, a guy named Creepy Carpus back in the 30s? Alvin Carpus, yeah. He did 30 years. 30. I got eight over him. This guy was a multiple killer. You know, we're talking John Dillinger era. This guy was a multiple killer. He did 30 years. I've seen, like I said, killers come and go. I've seen people that don't deserve to be alive come and go. Child killers, people that kill children, people that do things that are just unspeakable, come and go. I don't like it, you know, but I've put in my time. So anybody that's got a beef with me or thinks that, hey, this guy needs to be executed, anybody who may be watching, shoot your best shot. They've it's no exaggeration to call Patrick McKenna Anybody the emperor of death row. He spends 23 hours a day in isolation, but still commands respect from both inmates and corrections officers, in part because of his seniority on the row and in part because of his reputation as a dangerous hombre. The sheer enormity of his collective sentences makes him stand out, even among the hardened company at Ely State Prison. I've been in corrections almost 29 years, and... and there might have been a few over the years, but I can't, you know, specifically call to mind any inmate that has 16 different sentences and, you know, four of those are life sentences and one of them's a death penalty case. Warden McDaniel declines to characterize McKenna as his most dangerous inmate. He says they're all dangerous if you allow them to be. The Ely facility is a tight ship that doesn't allow for a lot of interaction among cons, something especially true for McKenna who's cleaned up his act over the past several years. In his earlier uh, career as a criminal, I guess, in the, in the system, had a lot of uh, what we call write-ups or disciplinary infractions within the facility. Um, they've kind of went up and down over the years. He's, um, in the last few years, he's slowed down a lot, and uh, he's uh, probably being uh, a little bit more watched a little bit more carefully in the last, you know, several years and uh, doesn't really have the opportunity to do some of the things that uh, he, he did in the past. For all of the crimes on McKenna's record, the escapes are what have earned him the most notoriety. Twice he slipped out of the maximum security facility at Carson City. Two more times he came close. After the infamous jail siege and his murder conviction, McKenna was returned to Carson City Somehow, he acquired a pistol and kept it hidden behind a shower wall for a year. In 1981, he used the gun to take nine guards hostage in yet another breakout attempt. He surrendered when prison officials refused to negotiate, commenting that he just wanted to give it a shot. You know, he, he gets a little smile when you talk about his escapes. He gets a little smile on his face. He recognizes he's not doing a good thing, but he, he, there's a, it's a point of pride for him almost, isn't it? You know, Pat's extremely intelligent, and having gone another way, uh, he could have been whatever he wanted to be. So I suppose in his world that he's in, um, sure, he, he probably does take pride in the success, the accomplishment uh, of an escape. I, I can completely understand that. When I was a youngster, I used to think about it a lot. And I used to put it into practice, and I used to do it. Later, it became more of an academic thing. Back then, I used to put things into action. I used to form an escape plan, and then I would put it into action, see if it worked, you know. And sometimes it did, and sometimes it didn't. But a lot of it was that. And when I was younger, I generally wanted to get the hell out, you know, and, and uh, do things, you know. The crown jewel in McKenna's career as an escape artist came here at the maximum security prison near Ely in the early 1990s when McKenna and another group of inmates came this close to busting out of death row. The Ely prison was open to be a new escape-proof facility built to house the worst of the worst. When McKenna transferred here in 1989, construction work was still underway. This reporter was in negotiations with McKenna and prison officials to arrange a death row interview. McKenna turned us down flat. I'm suspicious of the media in general. You know, I don't blame you. Because of personal experience with them, usually they work with the prosecutors.
The reason McKenna didn't want any attention from a reporter is that he had hatched another escape plan and was nearly ready to go. As part of the elaborate scheme, McKenna and five other death row denizens had used hair clippings and assorted scraps to create paper mache heads to help cover their absences. They used ropes made from bed sheets to access a crawl space above their cells, labored inside the crawl space to dig a hole through the cell block wall and somehow obtained wire cutters that could have sliced through the only fence that stood between them and freedom. They were awaiting the first storm of winter to go, but were ratted out by an inmate. Otherwise, McKenna says, he was gone. Prison officials insisted afterward the plot would never have succeeded. Like this place, I'm convinced in my head that I beat this place, this prison. These guys might not agree, but in my head, I think I beat this place. I did everything that was physically possible to do in order to get out of here. But it wasn't put into effect. And it was caught, well, I was caught before then. You know. And I freely owned up to it. I took responsibility for it. And I'm still paying for it. You know, I'm still uh, on the special classification 10 years later, 11 years later. And you say that in your head you got out of here. That was in 1991, just before I retired. Prison officials note that no one has successfully escaped from Ely, and since Warden McDaniel has been running the place, no one has even tried, not even McKenna. He doesn't leave his cell unless two officers are uh, escorting him, and he's been searched and properly restrained, and, and there's no one else out in the area that he could come in contact with. In other words, Pat McKenna isn't getting out of Ely State Prison? No. The McKennas believe it's the escapes, not the cellmate murder, that has kept Patrick on death row for so many years. There's no doubt. Explain that to me. Well, it's a combination. I have a long history with the state of Nevada. People that were lawyers became judges. Judges became politicians, governors, senators. I, I had a prosecutor once named Robert List. Do you ever hear of him? Yeah, sure. Judge, how about Michael Fondi? Yeah. All these people are judges, ex-governors or sit on the Supreme Court today. Mike Callahan, Robert List, Paul Laxall, Harry Reid, our senator, on and on and on. All these people I've had personal things with over the years as I've come up through this system, okay? You take that, and then you take the fact that I've done things against the system, like my takeover of the jail, my successful and not too successful escapes, the, the embarrassment it may cause certain officials, right? You take all that stuff into consideration, and you're going to have a lot of animosity between me and the state of Nevada in general. Ah, I piss them off. I make them mad time to time. Pat's theory is that these escapes uh, serve as an embarrassment to the system, and that's why they want to put them away. What do you think about that? I think that's absolutely true. You know, Pat, in many levels, is an embarrassment to the system. There's also a lot of guilt. Uh, regarding Pat, and there are people uh, who do know uh, that what happened to Pat uh, at Spring Mountain and other places and the way the system handled his particular problems, which weren't serious initially, uh, that they are guilty. Ken McKenna knows that blaming it on the system will likely elicit groans from the public, but if ever there was a case where it's true, his brother would seem to be it. After the abuse at home and the brutality of the Spring Mountain camp, young Patrick was sent away to a juvenile camp near Elko for committing petty crimes. He says he was bitter, not open to any help, and when he was released, he rejoined his young crew on the streets of Las Vegas. Now we're all older. We're teenagers now. We're dealing more serious things. We're pulling robbers. We're, we're getting involved in things that uh, we're doing we're doing peace work for the for the adults. Doing jobs for adults. You know, I'm not that. mentioning names or anything, but it involved unions and all that. McKenna won't so confirm it, but law enforcement sources say his teenage crime crew was linked for a time to a notorious father and son hitman team, Tom and Gramby Hanley, hired muscle who masterminded a rash of union-funded firebombings in Las Vegas and who were suspected of several murders for hire on behalf of mafia figures and labor leaders. The Hanleys were eventually sentenced to life for a mob-tainted hit on a union boss. Still only 16 years old, McKenna took a final stab at a straight life. His girlfriend became pregnant, so he married her, got a regular job, 
and had a plan to join the Marines when he turned 17. The dream didn't last long. The baby died, the baby girl. And I didn't handle that real well. I was kind of putting all my hopes on this, this family, then the Marines, right? That's where all my hopes and every rationalization I had for getting out of the criminal lifestyle was on that. When that didn't happen and the child and I started drinking, went back to the lifestyle. And in about four months, I was in prison. And then it's a downward spiral. And I've been in prison. That was 38 years ago. And I've been right here ever since. McKenna has committed terrible crimes, but in his view, he's never hurt a truly innocent person, only those already caught up in the criminal lifestyle. In a letter, he told us, each and every crime I've committed, without exception, has been against people in my world, in the life. I've never committed a crime against someone who wasn't in some way in the justice system or the criminal world. The Sunrise Mountain kidnap and assault is what first sent him to prison. McKenna says the teenagers he attacked were street gang members who'd given information to police about his crew. The cellmate he killed had a long rap sheet and he says was trying to kill him. He notes he never harmed the hostages during the jail takeover or during any of his attempted escapes, and various co-conspirators have testified that McKenna was adamant about not hurting anyone. The people he attacked during his brief periods of parole were all criminals, he said, drug dealers and others who were in debt to McKenna's gang associates still on the inside. It's not an excuse, McKenna says in his letter, just an explanation. I'm not a serial killer. I'm not, I'm not out there on the streets stalking people and killing people for my own perverse pleasure. I'm not doing that. I'm not blowing up buildings full of innocent people. I'm not blowing up airplanes. I thought that that's why we had death penalty, for those kind of crimes. But lately, recently, the last week or two, it's been brought to my attention that the death penalty is to prevent a man from escaping from prison. You don't have to uh, be a child killer or a mass murderer or a serial killer. You've got to be an embarrassment to the state. Mr. McKenna does not get to choose. Coming up, the state tries once again to send McKenna to the death chamber. But a new attorney has a new issue to raise. Well, it's just a technicality. Well, no, it's actually unconstitutional process. And if we give up that, you and I and everyone else lose. This is the room where prosecutors hope Patrick McKenna meets his end, Nevada's death chamber, where convicted killers are strapped down and injected with a lethal cocktail. For 24 years, a small army of lawmen and lawyers have tried to arrange McKenna's rendezvous with the executioner. And while McKenna was convicted for the slaying of his cellmate in 1979, he has twice had his death sentence reversed, once by the U.S. Supreme Court. But I'm not going to allow the state of Nevada to make me afraid or to make me think that they, because they say they're gonna kill me, I should worry about that, to hell with them. Bring it on. If they wanna do it, do it. But I don't think they can. You know, Pat has won every appeal he's ever had. That's why he hasn't been executed. Why does he win them? Because they make mistakes. Well, they're not just casual mistakes. They're errors in the process of justice. They shouldn't make those mistakes. Why do they make them? Because they don't care. They want the conviction. Opening statements began today in the penalty trial of Patrick McKenna. Of all Patrick hey, McKenna's court appearances, the most surreal the was the last, the 1996 the sentencing court. retrial, his third for the same murder. Security was unprecedented. The courthouse was surrounded by officers, dogs, and a helicopter. Inside, SWAT officers checked the courtroom, then stayed for the proceedings, armed to the teeth. 
Everyone who entered the building had to be screened twice, and McKenna was transported to the trial in a wheelchair with blinders on his eyes, mitts on his hand, two sets of chains, and a 50,000-volt stun belt around his waist. The measures were taken not only because of McKenna's prowess as an escape artist, but also because of rumored threats issued by the Aryan Brotherhood, McKenna's one-time prison associates. That security was there for a reason. I'm not at liberty to discuss all of those reasons, but I can tell you that he was uh, safely transported from the Nevada State Prison to the Clark County Jail, into court, back to jail, and back to prison. He didn't escape, and no civil rights were violated, and that's the mission accomplished for the Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department. McKenna thinks lawmen got some bad information, perhaps from a prison informant. He says he long ago gave up any affiliation with the Aryan gang, and that in solitary, he couldn't associate even if he wanted to. I'm retired. I'm not a member of anything. His family and lawyers see more sinister motives. And having all that security sitting around with machine guns on their laps under their little cloths and looking like uh, it's an armed siege, of course that affects the jury. It's intended to affect the jury. When they roll him down the hall in a, in a chair with a mask on that makes him look like Hannibal Lecter out of the movies and that shows up on the newspaper, of course that's intended to affect people. The, the prosecutor, I think, is going to attempt to use shotgun tactics in this hearing and just, you know, fill the courtroom with things that I may have done, people said I had done. If I were to tell you that this woman testified about being brutally raped and sodomized and beaten with beer bottles and kicked in the face and beaten with rocks and threatened with firecrackers and beaten with a stick with nails in it, wouldn't you agree that that offender needed to go to a maximum security prison? Patrick told me to take my clothes off and that he was going to have sex with me. Um, and if I tried anything, that he would kill me. And he killed or badly injured somebody else. There would be no one on this earth more conscience stricken than the family. The lead prosecutor in the 96 hearing was Dan Seaton, a longtime nemesis of McKenna's and one of the toughest prosecutors in Las Vegas history. Seaton relentlessly recited McKenna's life of crime for the jury, a kitchen sink assault. The DA's office believed then as now that McKenna's overall record warranted the death penalty. He was in custody and killed another inmate. If there is a poster child for the death penalty, that's it. I mean, if we can give somebody life without and they still are a threat to other inmates or guards or nurses that work, uh, I mean, life without then becomes, uh, becomes still a dangerous sentence. The proceedings marked a first for McKenna. He still wouldn't take the stand to explain his version of the jailhouse slaying, but this time he reluctantly allowed the jury to hear the story of his life as outlined by members of his family. The defense portrayed McKenna as a product of his environment, a creation of his own father. Put a belt, put his fist uh, with any object that was close by. You no, know, today he wouldn't have got away with this. He'd have been stopped earlier. And that wouldn't be where Pat is. McKenna said afterward that okaying the painful testimony from his family was among the toughest things he'd ever done. Public defenders Pete Laporta and Nancy Lemke unloaded their own emotional onslaught as they pleaded for McKenna's life. Patrick Charles McKenna will die in Ely State Prison. He will leave Ely State Prison in a pine box. That is what we do know. The question is, will God decide when or will you? Even though he didn't testify, McKenna was allowed to address the jury and to do something he'd never done before. I'm going to do it now, and I'm not going to be phony about it. I'm going to talk to you honestly, and I'm going to talk to you frankly, and I'm going to talk to you straight from the shoulder. Please do not let them execute me. They're doing it for the wrong reasons. They're using me as, a, as an example. Think about it. That's all I'm asking. Think about it. Don't be overwhelmed by the propaganda and the, the smoke screen. And I ask you straight, straightforward, honestly, not to execute me. And listen, I, I, I know this has been offered for me and probably for you, and I thank you for your patience. Thank you. You want to live? 
Well, whose choice is it? Mine or the state? Is it my choice? Yes, I want to live. I want out of prison today. I want to live in a condominium in South Beach, Miami. This is what I want. I can't have these things. But it's not my choice whether I live or die. For the first time, a jury found there were mitigating circumstances in McKenna's crime. They were moved by the story of his life. But in the end, the verdict was the same. This is the third time a jury has ruled McKenna should die for a 1979 killing. In these boxes are the sum total of Pat McKenna's life in the legal system. Court documents, affidavits, police reports. It now falls to defense attorney Patricia Erickson to sift through the mass of paper to figure out if McKenna might win yet another appeal of his death sentence. He has had really horrendous things occur in his cases. I mean, the Ninth Circuit does not reverse capital cases on something that's not important. Officially, Erickson's pending appeal is limited to what happened during the 96 hearings, but she intends to examine the entire record of the cellmate murder case. More pointedly, Erickson says the security at the 96 hearing was over the top and will be an issue. The entire argument was this man is a danger to society. He'll kill her, he'll escape, he'll kill again. Um, you know, you have, I never was inside, so I can't say, but my understanding was that there were SWAT, you know, armed SWAT members and that there, I mean, there's certainly the security at the, in the gate, you know, going through the front door, um, that, you know, that the kind of security is, is un, you know, unprecedented. And anybody that's ever been in the courthouse would know that. I mean, all those jurors who are being asked to decide whether Patrick McKenna should die for his prior crimes and this crime itself had to feel the immense, you know, that the, the incredible, you know, you don't have that kind of security unless that person is really, really dangerous. Erickson notes that while McKenna has been in prison for decades, there's never been a psychological evaluation of him to determine what shaped his psyche or whether he feels remorse. She asks whether society in general bears any responsibility. He started in our prison system at 11. We put him in, you know, horrendous situations from his early childhood on. I mean, he is a product of our prison system, and we need to take responsibility for that. Not even his family would argue that Pat McKenna is an innocent victim, but some whose lives have intersected with his wonder if death is the appropriate remedy. This is not an issue of sympathy for Pat McKenna, but clearly this is somebody who from almost from day one really didn't have much of a chance. I don't want to say he was predestined, but everything just was in order for him to be in trouble all of his life. Death? I, I, don't, I don't think so. He has done bad things, uh, but it's not all because of who he is. It's because of how uh, he uh, was treated. And the bottom line is, um, when it comes to his death penalty sentence, it's unnecessary. It's not necessary to execute Pat McKenna. Since then, 1961, there has been no executions in the state of Nevada that have not been voluntary. You know, legal suicide, every execution has been a guy just given up and legally committing suicide. There's never been. Now, why is that? Because the state of Nevada has such a, a fouled up legal structure in order to get the death penalty that convictions never hold up. They're overturned, they're vacated, or you drag them through the court for 20 years. All they have to do to stop all that is to give you a fair trial in the beginning. When all 
this happened. I was 24 years old. Uh, I was married uh, uh, to a really good woman uh, who had two kids of her own. And uh, I don't know. I don't know what happened. I don't know why. I, I've, I've even stopped questioning it because I, I can't figure it out. Timothy Gribble raped and murdered two women in Galveston, Texas. He was sentenced to death in 1987. And it hurts that I, I know that I'm, I'm that individual they're talking about. Uh, because, you know, when I look inside of myself, I don't think I am. Uh, I see myself as just who I've always been and, and perfectly normal. In my mind, I don't think I'm capable of those things, but obviously I was. I grew up middle class. Uh, I had every opportunity offered to me in the world uh, of education, of employment, of, of community. Uh, and so it's not like I can, I can fall back and say, well, I was underprivileged or I was in a bad situation. I wasn't. Most of my life was working for my father, who owned a uh, full service service station. And I just like to, to go out and, and be around the people. You know, I'd pump the gas cars, you wipe the windows, you talk to people. And I got really well, or good, at, at uh, communicating with people. You know, hi, how you doing? And I uh, enjoyed it. Uh, I look forward to going to work. Now, I've got uh, two sisters and a brother all older than me. I'm the baby of the family. In the 12 and a half years I've been here, my brother's been up maybe twice. Uh, he's coming back from execution. You know that there's somebody who's supposed to be executed? No, nah, I didn't know nothing about that. They didn't let it kill them every day. People in Huntsville talk about the executions? Not really. Well, I haven't really been around about it that talk about it, really. Why do you think that is? I don't know. I really don't know. Yeah, like I said, you do the crime, you pay the uh, fine. The citizens of Texas are pretty outspoken that if you do crime in Texas, uh, you're going to spend penitentiary time. Uh, if you kill somebody in Texas, if you uh, commit capital murder, you will be executed in Texas. Every day, inmates are released from prison with $50 and a bus ticket voucher. The first time I ever been in trouble in my life, and they gave me 18 years. So. What were you in trouble for? Burglary. I was sitting there for a DWI, and they hard on DWIs. And it's like, it's like, Murdering somebody almost. I was in there for a robbery, you know, kind of uh, took a lot of dope at the time, you know, and just went to robbing folks, you know. Shouldn't have done that, but I was young. Got in a fight with a kid, a 16 year old kid. So they gave me five years from it. The guard, some of them, most of them, you know, they try to give you a hard time. Uh, you just got to learn to deal with it, you know. I was on a Ellis One where Death Row is, and it's it's wild over there. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. I uh, got the execution date for March 15th. And uh, 45 days before my date, they moved me to solitary. Solitary is pretty much a, a punishment wing. There's no uh, radios, there's no televisions. Uh, so it's hot all the time. Uh, a lot of noise because it's usually the troublemakers that are housed on, on solitary. I felt it was almost like mental torture to take a man who's, who you've told, we're going to kill you in a month and a half, but in the meantime, we're going to put you in solitary confinement and uh, isolate you from everything you've ever known down here in this life and make you listen to these uh, people banging and hollering all the time. And it's, it's pretty hard to cope with. This is the way the system works. Uh, it is, uh, well, it's a tough system. It's, uh, I mean, these people are put in here for, for doing something on the street that put them in a situation where they have to be incarcerated. It's not a situation that uh, I would, by any stretch of the imagination, would call it to be a cruel or inhumane system. I got to visit twice a month. My mom, bless her heart. She come down like clockwork twice a month. I told him not to come. He just did my time. It's better. It's better without visits to me anyway because it makes my time hard. Once they leave, I'm sad, you know. So I'd rather did it like I've done it. That's the worst part of doing time, being away from your family. I don't take anything for granted. 
especially uh, the little things of being able to open a door, you know, of uh, going to the bathroom without somebody walking by yourself. You know, there's no doors in this place. There's no privacy. Uh, just a simple touch of somebody holding your hand or a hug from a, a friend. These things that people do every day and just totally take for granted. A close companion to talk to. Where I'm at now, I have no one to talk to. If you don't have something outside of you to look at, then you go within and you daydream. You fantasize, you, you think of better days. Uh, what ifs? Uh, what do you dream about? Uh, freedom. Uh, what does any prisoner dream about? Uh, walking out these gates. Now I'm going home. I'm going to be with my babies. Yeah, I'm waiting on them to come pick me up. They should be here soon. I'm going back to Dallas. I got a few kids I got to take care of. You know, it's time to you know, straighten my life up and fly right. First thing I'm going to eat, I'm going to go eat, eat some red lobster or something. I'm going to go eat some, some real food. This place ain't for me. Bye-bye, Huntsville. See you later. Nobody wants to grow up to be a, a death row inmate. Uh, maybe I didn't appreciate what I had or, or uh, how uh, easily it could be all taken away. right here. We're 70 miles north of Houston and about 170 miles south of Dallas. Huntsville was settled in 1835 by Alabama pioneer Pleasant Gray. He established the town in what was then Mexico with two log cabins and an Indian trading post. Now Texas is the only state that people uh, always report to you how many generations they've been here with pride. I'm proud to say that I'm a Texan. In fact, one of my ancestors fought with Sam Houston at the Battle of San Jacinto, and I'm, that, I'm pretty proud of that. She's one of Sam Houston's great, great, great. Just one great. Just one great. I'm not that old. Well, here. <laughs> Huntsville's favorite son, General Sam Houston, liberated Texas from Mexico in the Battle of San Jacinto and served as the new republic's first president. You've got to lay claim to something, and Sam Houston is really the only thing that we've got to lay claim to. I mean, he lived here, he died here, and we've got him in effigy out there, 67 feet high. He's our boy. How many Mexican soldiers died in this battle? Kim? Over 600. How about Texans? How many Texans, Ryan? Nine. Yeah, nine Texans died. It was one of the most decisive victories in the history of the world. Now, the killing, though, went on into the evening. The Texans wanted revenge, and they'd lost brothers, they'd lost fathers in the Alamo, so now they were thirsty for revenge. Sam Houston tried to get control of his men. He didn't believe in just these murderous acts after the war had already been won. What did Sam Houston do on April the 1st? Do you remember, Kim? He executed four men. That's right. He hung four men, had them, had them executed because they'd been robbing, stealing, and looting. And it also helped his authority over his soldiers. They knew that when he said something, he was going to follow through with it. How about our prisons today? What if Sam Houston could come to Huntsville and he would look around and, and see the prisons, which they were just getting started at the end of Sam Houston's life, the, the Texas prison system? I think he would disapprove of the death row system because he hung those four men. He didn't wait. He just did it. In other words, he disapproved of the way it's done now? Right. Oh, OK. Allison? Also, when he hung those men, they were only like robbers and like troublemakers. And today, we just hold them for like five years to 10 years and then let him go. He definitely wouldn't approve of that. I think that he would be glad that they were locked up because they did something wrong. But I don't think he'd be happy that there's so many people in prison. Probably be sad just by the number of lawbreakers, right? He'd be saddened by that. I don't think he would like that they get to play basketball whenever they want and go out and run track whenever they want, because he was, like, really into the justice, you know? 
Tiffany? He'd probably say all the cells should be empty. They should all be dead by now. Kill them. Get rid of them. <laughs> get rid of them. Okay, he might. But let me remind you of something. During the Battle of San Jacinto, remember Sam Houston, and he used very, very strong language, and I'm not going to repeat it, to try and stop his men from killing those Mexican soldiers once the battle was over. He did what he believed was best and not what was popular. In 1849, Sam Houston led Huntsville in a fierce competition to become the state capital. When Austin won, Huntsville was awarded the lucrative state penitentiary as a consolation prize. The town's penal history is on display at the Texas Prison Museum in the main square. It is a model of the oldest prison site in the state of Texas. It is, proper name is the Huntsville Unit, but everybody calls it the Walls. These are items that have been made by the inmate population to use against one another and uh, the security officers in escape attempts. They can take practically nothing and make it into a weapon. The slingshot here is a recent contribution from down at the McConnell unit. The spear that's leaning against the wall is nothing except rolled up paper. And the point of the spear is a paper clip that has been straightened out, and then they take it and rub it on concrete floor to it's just like a needle. This is uh, the electric chair that was used by the state of Texas from 1924 through 1964. Uh, 361 men lost their life in this chair during that period of time. After popular support for capital punishment sank to an all-time low in the late 1960s, the U.S. Supreme Court joined the rest of the Western world in outlawing the death penalty. But political tides turned, and America resumed capital punishment in 1977. One-third of the nation's executions since then have taken place in Huntsville. Oh, Sparky. The inmates call it that. The gentleman who did most of the construction of it, was supposed to be a occupant, an occupant of the chair. Uh, I have nothing to back that up, but we do know that uh, he was, his sentence was commuted, so he did not sit in the chair officially. Inmate population caused it, oh, Sparky. The prison system has been here so long it is a part of the state and the local history. Uh, you cannot separate it all. It is here, and we do the best with it that we can. This area right here is known as the death house. When the inmate is brought in for execution, the inmate is brought in in a van, these series of gates. Once the van is inside here, this gate will be closed and the inmate will be escorted out of the van and into this, into this door here. The inmate is, at this time, the inmate is shackled by uh, his hands and by his feet. I had a hard time these past few weeks trying to adjust myself mentally for my execution, to, to say all my last goodbyes to my, my friends at the other unit, the inmate can visit with family, friends, that type of thing. But once the inmate is in the confines of this building, no, no more contact. Once you become a death row inmate, you'll never be able to hug your mother again, shake hands with your father, anything like that. It just doesn't happen. I could probably name off 20 people that I was really good friends with, talked to every day, you know, uh, that have been executed. You see them walk out and you know where they're going, you know that they're gonna be killed. And here you are, you're still alive. You almost feel guilty for being alive. That it's, you know, I don't know. About an hour prior to the execution, uh, in Texas the execution time is 6 p.m. The inmate will be removed from this cell and taken to this cell right here. You spend the last hour in this cell. 
It is from this cell, when 6 o'clock comes, that the amulet will leave the uh, cell and go through the green door. Up until the time it is time for their execution, they will never see what's behind that door. I hate to confront death. I, I know it's, it's present. I know that I'm, I'm on track for it. I've got two weeks to live. But I just hate to, to actually confront it, to uh, think about it head on. You know, I can, I can conceptualize death. Yeah, I'm not going to be here anymore. Uh, but to actually think about laying down on the gurney and having a needle in my arm and knowing that any moment I'm, I'm strapped to this gurney, any moment they're going to pull the curtains back. And there is going to stand my f family and friends and five members of, of the victim's families and, and their friends, probably the, the uh, district attorney. And I'm going to have to, to confront this whole situation. Uh, this whole scenario of, of here you are, you're going to die. And uh, oh, it's, it's, it's scary. Members of St. Stephen's Episcopal Church hold a special service every execution day. For the correctional officers it's very easy here in Huntsville, where they take place, to ignore what's happening. For the executioners who represent us, give them peace. We have those few agents that do the actual lethal injection, but it's on all our hands. For the people of Huntsville that we remain problem it's not the people who take a stand one way or another it's all the apathy in in the community they're blindly letting the state run a system that takes people's lives and they don't know anything about it regardless whether you're for or against it just get involved i mean take a stand looks like a quiet night tonight <laughs> A lot of times it depends upon who it is, how, how much notoriety he has or whatever. He will be the 12th execution of this year and the 211th since lethal injection began. I don't want my family to be there to witness my execution. That's <clears throat> not the last image I want to leave them with. I mean, they've, they've known me all my life from, from time I was a baby. Uh, they don't need to see me die like that. Now, I need to make a make one change. The sister and the father are not going to do it. This area right here is where we bring the uh, witnesses in that witness the execution. They'll come down this hallway. I've witnessed executions where the inmate has gone out singing a hymn. And then I've had uh, other inmates who have gone out literally with a curse in their lips. I've had them say, well, I'm not going to say anything for my final statement. And yet, when the time comes, when the warden asked them for the final statement, uh, would give one of the more eloquent speeches that you heard, you know. I've had them go out praising the Dallas Cowboys. <laughs> and inmate Gribble, uh, when I visited with him earlier this afternoon, he wanted to... Uh, he emphasized that he didn't want anything in the court stopping him from being executed. That's his choice. Uh, he's ready to be executed. He made that quite clear. Now, you got to remember that most of these people had been here for a period of time, and they've had time to get ready for this day, which they knew eventually was going to happen. So mentally, they're prepared for it. A lot of them are spiritually prepared for it. Uh, a lot of them look forward to being just the next step on a journey, that uh, anything would be better than where I have been. From my point of view, 
uh, death is almost a release because strictly from a personal standpoint, I won't have to wake up in here anymore. The people that are going to have to deal with my passing when I'm gone are my family. Uh, my, my, my friends that I've created good friendships with outside, uh, they're going to have to live with the, the fact that the state killed me, that I was executed, and they're going to be a, a whole new set of victims. Whereas if I had spent the rest of my life in prison, it would have been hell for me, but they would have had, I would have been there, you know. There wouldn't have been that loss for them. And so I really regret it for, from that standpoint. But that's, it's here and there. <laughs> prison changes people. The condemned person, nine times out of ten, is a completely different person than he was when he or she committed the crime. I keep it in perspective by knowing that they have changed. I go back and I read the crime itself what mistake they made to find themselves in a position where they're a candidate for execution. That, that gives me a balance on the thing, that knowing what, the, what these victims must have suffered. I mean, they've all suffered a pretty horrible, horrible death. Uh, and even though I get to know the inmate and recognize that he's changed, I never want to get to the point that I overlook what that person did to get there. I'll come back here just when the inmate arrives. And the purpose of that really is to, first of all, find out if he has anything he wants to say to the medium. And, uh, and in lots of cases, to say goodbye. There's a lot of these guys I do know. Goodbye, fella. Have a good trip. Once the inmate is hooked up uh, to the IVs, which come through that little portal there, there's only three people in this room. A chaplain stands at the foot of the inmate, and the warden will stand approximately in this position. The warden will ask the inmate if he has any final statements, and if he does, he will address either this side over here, which is the victim side, or this side over here, which is the actual inmate side. If a man ever had anything to say, now's the time to say it. People actually will pay attention to you when you're you're dying, you're, you have a last statement, they'll actually listen. And so I'm taking a lot of time to, to, to try to say the right things. First and foremost, I want to apologize to the victim's family uh, and, and for the crime that I committed. Uh, they, I really don't want to say too much. I don't want to offend them, but I, I have thought about them a lot over the years, about the loss that they've had to go through. Uh, I lost my freedom. Basically, I lost my life. And I know how precious life is now. It, it took this place here uh, in 12 years of my life to come to grips with how precious and, and fleeting life is. It takes about two minutes from start to finish as far as the chemicals getting into the body. The person is clinically dead when the first chemical hits because it's such a massive dose. Once that chemical hits, it's, it's irreversible. They, they can't come back. The only thing that you will hear during the execution is uh, an escape of air from the lungs when the uh, diaphragm of the lungs collapse from the uh, second chemical. Uh, it's over in just a matter of minutes. There is no way that I can know your sorrow for losing someone so close to you. It was a horrible thing that I did, and I regret it deeply. 
I don't know if this will ease your pain, but I truly pray that this will help you find peace. When you live someplace that uh, gets referred to at times as the execution capital of the world, it does give you some pause for thought. The family of those people executed are victims as much as the others. In my view, they're victims of the defendant. The defendant's family are, are his victims as well because of what they put them through. Uh, but people lose a lot. And it's... Uh, it's not an issue that's ever going to be black and white and cut and dried.